Uh, yeah, yeah, well, no, you'll get a different graph every time because the, the, the graph of the protein is using asymptote. Don't ask me how asymptote, I mean, it, it, well, you get a, well, no, you get a different perspective. I mean, you'll probably get the same, you can rotate it and, and you, This, this homomorphism. Yeah, 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 yeah. The homo yeah, I'll come on to, on to that. Wait, wait, I'll, I'll come on to that. Can I, can I talk now? Or? Yeah? I'm allowed to? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Grand. Um, so then the question that we, we can look at later is which, which, uh, which of those knots is it? So um, let me go on to an algorithm. Um, it, this is really... <laughs> The algorithms, you just do the obvious thing, and, and it seems to work quite well. So the algorithm I want to talk about then is uh, you start off with a finite regular CW complex. So finite meaning I've only got finitely many cells, like in the torus. Well, let's suppose I have a discrete vector field on it, and I'd like to extend... No, a discrete vector field could consist of zero arrows. I could start off with a discrete vector field and no arrows, but, but then let me produce a new discrete vector field which has all of the existing arrows and possibly an extra one. And if I can do that repeatedly, I can build up discrete vector fields. So I'm going to input a finite regular CW complex with an admissible discrete vector field. Maybe this discrete vector field has no arrows. Um, and I'm going to output an admissible involving possibly an additional arrow. And then I'm going to repeat that algorithm over and over that's the way to build up discrete vector fields. And what's the procedure? Um, it really is. Uh, I have a picture on the next slide which explains it, so let me read it quickly. If there's a critical cell, EN plus 1, with just one critical cell, EN, in its boundary, so you search for critical cells with just one critical cell in the boundary, and if you find one, then add the arrow from EN to EN plus 1. But that's it. Well, else, if you don't find one, uh, but if there's a critical cell, then choose one and deem that to be, and I made this word up for the slide, dormant. I don't, I don't really know what to be. <laughs> dormant, but not critical. So now, now I'm introducing a new term. I've got critical cells. Are the cells not involved in arrows? But because I'm trying to create a new field, I've got this term dormant. I think if I if I run an example, uh, it should ex I sh it should explain it. Yeah, we, we skip over. Let's do the example. So here's a a, dis a a regular CW complex with a discrete vector field. In fact, there are no arrows at all. So I'm starting from 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 scratch. So I look for a a cell. Uh, which has just one critical, at the, at the moment, um, what did I say, I'm looking for a cell with just one critical cell in the body. Well, there aren't any. If you look at any cell there, the boundary has more than one critical cell because everything's critical. So what do I do? I, um, else down here, choose something and deem it to be dormant. So let me do that. I d I, I'm going to deem the zero cell one to be dormant. Yeah, so it's not critical now, it's dormant, whatever that means. But it's not critical. Now what do I do? I go back. Um, if there's a critical cell with just w one critical cell in its boundary, then add an arrow. Well, the dormant cells aren't critical. So I, I, I don't know which one I looked at, but pro probably E5. If I look at the, the one cell, E5, that has two cells in the boundary, one and two. One, I said, oh gosh, that's no longer critical, that's dormant. So now I only have one critical cell in the boundary of E5. I have the cell, the zero cell number two, so I'm gonna put an arrow from two to E5, or the equivalent, I, d I can't remember how I did it. Oop, that was the one. Yeah. So now I've, I've created, and now I'm gonna go again. Can we find a cell uh, with just one critical cell in the boundary. Well, for example, if I look at E3, I, I don't know which one I did, but E3 would do. If I look at E3, it's the two cells in the boundary, four and two. Only one of those is critical. So I could put an arrow from four to E3. 
or I might have done something. I don't quite know what I did. Well, let, let, let's just see what I did. What did I do? No, I did somewhere else. Oh, I did it from yeah E1. E1 is also grand. E1 uh, only in the previous step up here, E1 only has one critical cell in the boundary, because this is dormant. So just add an arrow from the critical cell here to E1, which is what I've done down, down here. And I got this. Oh, and I did E5. I did two things. No, no, I, I got my, where am I? I, I don't know what I did. But I've, I've got this, this cell here. Yeah, you know, I, I, that arrow. And you just keep going. Um, ah, sorry. Okay. I'm probably shouting too loud or something. Yeah. Okay. And and you keep going uh, and you'll end up with with a, a, a a discrete vector field on your regular CW complex, which this is the kind of thing that was used in the gap calculations that I was doing there. This very naive algorithm amazingly works quite well in, in lots of examples. Um, OK. Um, just, just to show that. You know there are difficulties which which I don't understand, and I, I so I'm not going to talk about them because I don't understand them. But I'm going to mention that there are difficulties. So let's uh, say then that a regular CW complex is collapsible if it admits an admissible discrete vector field with just one critical cell. So how you think of that is if you can have a dis uh, discrete vector field with just one critical cell, these arrows really tell you a way to homotopy your space down to a point using this disk. That's what collapsible means. Um, so collapsible certainly implies contractible. And for group cohomology, we're interested in collapsible spaces. Um, so discrete vector fields are handy, but we should bear in mind that, that <laughs> contractible does not imply collapsible, so you can't expect this method to always work, but it seems to work in practice. Um, let me convince you that it doesn't work. I have this on the computer, but I think what it's in the code on the website. Rather than run more buttons, I'll skip this code. So there's a on the website there's a, there's a gap command Bing's house, uh, which which constructs this CW complex. So Bing's house has it's a house with two rooms. There's an upstairs room and a downstairs room, and the entrance to the downstairs room is through the attic. You go down into the downstairs room, and the entrance to the upstairs room is from underneath up into the, from, from underneath up. Um, and then there's a partition wall here and a partition wall there, and that's Bing's house. And um, you can use gap commands. Uh, I think it's one of the exercises anyway. To, well, you can ask GAP to, to produce a discrete vector field, and it will find a discrete vector field, and it won't have um, a single critical cell. It'll have more than one. That doesn't tell you much. Um, but you can actually see that this, this is not collapsible. I think I'll probably just leave it as an, an exercise for people who are If it were collapsible, you'd have to start off your sequence of arrows going in some fashion. You'd kind of let me skip <laughs> why it's <laughs> why it's not collapsible, uh, but it's, it's not difficult. But but let me just say, and you can do this in GAP, that if you take this uh, modified Bing's house, so what I've done here is is by this partition wall, I've added, it, added in a solid brick. So I've added in a, 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 an open three-dimensional cell and I guess an open two-dimensional top of the cell. So I've added in two cells, a three cell and a two cell. So this space is certainly homotopy equivalent to this space because all I've done is I've added in 
uh, uh, you know, this, this three cell which I can squash down with a homotopy. So they're definitely homotopy equivalent. And you can use the gap command uh, critical cells. Th this space is there under the name modified Bing's house. You can do the gap commands and you'll find that this space is collapsible. So using gap, you can prove that this is collapsible and you can observe that, well, at least the gap <laughs> function doesn't find a collapse of this space and you have to think theoretically why, in fact, this space admits no collapsible um, sequence of spaces. But I won't, I won't, I'll skip that. Okay, so let me just say something about fundamental groups because I use the fundamental group command. Um, so let X be a regular CW complex with an admissible discrete vector field and a unique critical, I've forgotten the word critical, zero cell. <laughs> Let's suppose then that you have a regular CW complex with an admissible discrete vector field, which uh, of the zero cells, there's precisely one which is critical. Yep. Um, and the algorithm that I gave over there actually can produce such a, if the space is connected, you know, you can always construct that. Um, the fundamental group, what is it? Well, one way to define it is to say it's the finitely presented group. Uh, well, it's a finitely presented group with one generator for each critical cell and one relator, well, one generator for each critical one cell and one relator for each critical two cell. Let, let me give an example of, of to, to pad this definition out. If we look at this regular CW complex with our discrete vector field, I'm saying that you can read, and, and I'll explain on the next slide how, you can read off from this a presentation for the fundamental group. There should be one generator in the presentation for each critical one cell. So there are two critical one cells, so there are two generators. And then there's only one critical two cell. So we'll have to have one relator, and I have to explain what that relator is. Um, so let me do that. I'll try to explain what the relator is. I'm interested in this cell, F2, and how it attaches to the one skeleton. So let's see how it attaches to the one skeleton. And let me use the arrows of the discrete vector field to, to see how it attaches. So, I mean, this, is, this in red is the boundary of the cell F2. And the boundary has, involves a critical cell here, but some non-critical cells. And I'm not keen on having non-critical cells in the boundary because the, the relator has to be a, an expression, a word in, in X and Y, which correspond to the critical cells. So what I can do is I can use maybe the arrow here to, to homotopy that red loop to that loop. Um, and I can probably homotopy things further. What did I do there? E6, uh, there's an arrow from, there's a, there's a collapse or whatever from E6 going into this cell. So I can kind of push this edge through this two cell so that it, 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 it looks like that. And now I can probably use the arrow uh, here from this cell out there to push it like this. And now there's no more pushing I can do. There are no more arrows going from one cells in this red loop. Look at the red loop. And the red loop loops around one cells. But all of the one cells now are the s either critical, they're either critical or the source of arrows, or the target of arrows. None of the source. So I can't do any more pushing. So now I have to read around the, the red loop uh, whatever it is. I read around the red loop and I go, I don't know, uh, was this X, well, I got E8 was Y. I go Y inverse, then I'm down here, X, Y, uh, where am I? Um, 
I, I, I've done something wrong. I should. <laughs> wait, wait, let me do it again. I read around the loop. Uh, let, where do I start? I'm going to start in the top right-hand corner, uh, which, and I'm going to go around this way. So I'm, I'm reading y, and then I come down here, and then I read. Ah, no, which way around am I going? Am I, am I going this way? Yeah, <laughs> let, let, me, let me think. Uh, doesn't look right, does it? What, what am I? I go around this loop and I get y. Depends which way I'm going around, doesn't it? Um, I get x. Y, and I come up here. Doesn't look at all right, does it? I seem to get Y inverse X. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm. Am I going around one loop the wrong way? I would have thought I'm. I'm, I'm trying to. I, uh, I don't know. I, I. I get. That's my Y. Then I'm up here which comes down here. I'm puzzled now. I go to the, oh, E2, ah, E2, yeah, I didn't mark it in thick, but yeah, yeah, E2 is there, thank you very much, I was getting, I was panicking then, yeah, there's an, e, there's an X there, and then a Y inverse and an X inverse, yeah, so if you can read it properly, you get, um, uh, the, the relator xy equals yx, the relator for the torus. Uh, yeah, phew, okay. So <laughs> let's move on. Um, okay, so let me just recall then oh, the, the definition of the cohomology of groups. So if you have a group G and you're interested in its cohomology, you can, I mean, there are, there are, you can define it algebraically, which is more general, but you can have a, give a, 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 a more, more specialized definition um, as the homology or the cohomology of a group G is the cohomology of a certain space BG, where what is BG? Well, I'm going to take BG to be any CW complex you can find, anyone, arising as a quotient of a space EG on which G acts, modulo the action of G, uh, provided that EG is contractible and that G acts on it freely. Uh, I corrected this typo last night. <laughs> um, it has to be a free action. So you're free to choose any space, and then you'll, you'll get the cohomology like that. So it does uh, mean that I should talk about the cohomology of spaces because that's what we're interested in, cohomology of groups, but cohomology of groups you can think of as cohomology of certain spaces, contractible spaces, um, or quotients of contractible spaces. So let me say something about the cohomology of spaces very quickly then. Um, if you have a regular CW complex X, uh, you can create the, the, the chain complex, uh, or a cellular chain complex, uh, which is a, a, a chain complex involving free abelian groups, where in degree n, Cn of x is the free abelian group generated uh, by n cells, or by elements corresponding to n cells. And there's a, in the regular CW complex, there's, there's a very natural uh, notion of boundary, which is defined on generators, which goes from the free abelian group Cn of x to the free abelian group Cn minus 1 of x, which sends a, now I'm going to think of En as a, an algebraic object, a generator of my free abelian group, and it sends it to the sum of the, the cells or the generators lying in the boundary of the closure of the generator. Where there's a epsilon j, which has to be plus or minus 1, What's epsilon j? How do you define that? Well, you just define it uh, to ensure <laughs> this uh, important property that the square is zero. And that's, that's all you have to do on the computer. And there's kind of a straightforward algorithm to choose the epsilon j's uh, such that that holds. So if you have a regular CW complex, you can write down this, this chain complex and you can calculate its homology. There's nothing exciting in that. 
Um, then the homology of the space X with integer coefficients is by definition the kernel of the homomorphism dn quotiented by the image of the homomorphism dn plus 1. And I have to say, the next definition was not how I first understood it, but I mean, that's all it is. If you're interested in the cohomology, you just take transpose of matrices and do that. I mean, that, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's not the right way to think of cohomology, but if you're on a computer, as Alexander said yesterday, that, that's what cohomology is. So it's the same thing. You're just taking transposes. And you, I probably have made mistakes with my indexes, but I, maybe not. Anyway, so you have to be careful. OK, so we have everything. We have the cohomology spaces and, and what the cohomology group is. So now, if you happen to construct a contractible space, e.g., for your given group, and I've done that already with this Bieberbach group, because my space, e.g., was three-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, which I gave a CW structure. Uh, the quotient, it's just you take one generator for each orbit of, of cells. So the quotient is, is very simple. Or I suppose algebraically, you're taking the tensor product to get a chain complex now of free abelian groups. And you take its homology. Um, and I've mentioned that before. This is contractible. So the chain complex C star of EG will actually be a, an exact sequence of, of groups. Um, and now I'm on to gap session three. I, I, I can't remember what gap session three is, but let me go to it. Ah, well, I won't do the Bing bit. I'll, I'll let you play with that if you want. Let me do uh, some group cohomology. Let me construct a group in gap, a matrix group. And uh, so somebody came to ask, I'm actually using, uh, I'm calling Polymake software. So if you try this on your computer and you don't have Polymake so software I installed, you just get an error. OK, so, so I'm, I'm, I forgot to say that. Um, let me just try to calculate the cohomology of a group. Uh, I'm from Ireland, where William, oh, what happens? Let, let, me, let, me, let, let me not do that. I, I went too far where William Rowan Hamilton <laughs> uh, is from. Um, so here's a group, the, 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 the group of quaternions generated by two matrices. This is the gap representation of it. Two matrices, A and B, uh, four by four matrices, and I'm taking the group generated by them. Um, I can ask for the order of the group or whatever um, order. I hope it's eight. <laughs> yep, it's, it's the group of quaternions. And so the next command, I'll just do it again, is, is I'm going to do the following. Uh, I'm now in the finite group case. Now, that's, it's not great. I have to, you don't see the, <laughs> maybe I could just bring this down. Yeah, yeah. I've lost my command. Let, 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 me, go, let me go back. I'll do it again. Okay, so, so what was it? I did this. Um, I took my group Q, which acts on three dimensions. It's, it's matrices, so I'm, I'm acting on, on four-dimensional space. And I take a, a, a vector in four-dimensional space. I took the vector 1, 0, 0, 0. And I'm looking at the orbit of that vector under the action of this group of order 8. So I'm going to get, it turns out, I'm going to get eight vectors in four-dimensional space. I'm going to take their convex hull uh, using polymake software. So I'm going to get a convex space, which is contractible. Um, and let's look at it, or at least let's look at the one skeleton of this, uh, this convex hull. It's a contractible space. That's just the one skeleton. And the group G acts on it by permuting vertices and permuting cells. It's a linear action, so it acts on this polytope. What's the next command? So I've, I've constructed then a, a polytope on which the group acts. So I've constructed a, a, co a, a, com a contractible space. Let me uh, do a couple more commands. Let me put this in the format of kind of 
the space. So, so I'm going to create this as a chain complex. So I'm doing the same thing again, but the output is now going to be a chain complex, a which, which models a, an equivariant you know, universal cover. So I'm going to ask for all of the cells, I'm going to ask for the order of the stabilizer of each cell. And again, I happen to have chosen as a group on which every stabilizer has order one. So this group acts freely on my polytope. So now I'm in business. A contractible space, e.g., on which the group G acts freely. So I can take the quotient and I can ask for the homology, which is what I'll do. I'll ask for the homology in, in degree three. So I do the same thing again. Um, take the, the R then, if you like, is the chain complex of this quotient. That's the chain complex. It's a complex of free abelian groups. And I take its homology. And you get the homology, which is cyclic of order eight. So it's, it's a calculation. And you can do other things. Uh, you could calculate presentations of groups and so on. I think I'll skip that um, using that. So, <laughs> I'm in the wrong place. Yeah. Oh, well, let me just go on, because that was a very small group. Um, oh, well, OK, and, I, and it was in low degree. So let me do some other things. Um, let me. Let me do these commands. Let's just see what we have here. Um, the first command just, asks, just prints R, and it says that it's a resolution, a, 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 an exact sequence of modules, um, with no contracting homotopy. So I haven't actually implemented the contracting homotopy. Let me do for the same group. Uh, 100 terms of the resolution. <laughs> so that was quick. Uh, I know, I'll use a different algorithm. I, I won't go into that. No, no, this is a, a different, but, but still, I, I've got 100 terms of it. So you, if you want the, the 100th term of the, um, you, you can do the same thing. Now I can go back to uh, homology uh, or in degree 99, and we should hopefully get a number out. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> it's great that you're there. <laughs> S, S. Uh, oh, it's eight again. Well, it's actually a periodic group. Yeah, so, so that that's. Um, and then th that's a little bit small as an example. So now um, I'm just going to do a few more examples. Um, there was, well, there's a paper by Milgram. Milgram, James Milgram, which says that there was a conjecture of Jean-Louis Laudet. I remember mentioning it to Jean-Louis Laudet. I never conjectured that. Anyway, so I don't know whether there was a conjecture or not. But the, the, the supposed conjecture was that if a group G, if a finite group G, if a non-trivial, no, if a finite group G has trivial integral homology in degrees 1, 2, and 3, then the group should be trivial. And it turns out. Uh, that there's a counterexample to that. So let's just have a go. I'm going to take the Mathieu simple group, N23. M maybe I should say something about this group, first of all. In GAP, GAP has st 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 stored in it uh, various groups. So let me take the Mathieu simple group, M23, and ask for its order. So this is uh, probably Alexander's work or whatever, but you've got permutation groups. So let's take its order. And it's whatever it is. Is it a million or something like that? So it's, it's, a, it's a bigger group than of size 8. And then let's go and take the, the group homology of G in degree 1. It's thinking. Don't know why it's thinking. 
Why is it taking so long? Anyway, it's, it's trivial. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a simple group, so it's perfect. Yeah, well, OK, but it, is, it, is it super perfect? I'm a bit nervous at doing this, but maybe two is faster than that. I don't know. I, uh, let's see about degree two. No, it's, it's, it's trivial homology. In the, that's my notation for trivial homology. Let's have a look at dimension three. This is all proved by Milgram, so it's nothing new, but it's just it's a, it's a fun way to do it. Uh, oh, three. And let's just get carried away now. <laughs> um, what about the fourth homology of that group? I think I tried this before. I'll give it 10 seconds. Yeah, it's trivial. And I won't do the fifth homology, but you'll find that the fifth homology is cyclic of order seven, seven. Yeah, yeah. So you'll, f you'll find that, the, the, you know, so. so, so. Hmm? Oh, you did it. <laughs> Thank you. One minute. Okay, I, I won't do that. But okay, so that, that's uh, some gap, and I have to keep an eye on the time. OK, so what was going on in the bigger examples? I mean, I've cheated now. <laughs> I was giving you, um, I think, what I felt was a full explanation of how to calculate the homology of the group of order 8 by constructing a contractible space and uh, doing this business. How did GAP work for the large group of order a million? Um, so you use a tiny bit of theory there. So let's uh, introduce uh, some terminology. Um, if you have a, a, an, a, an admissible discrete vector field, then it's not difficult to take the definition I've given of, of this vector field and convert it into algebra. And what you find algebraically is that your, con your discrete vector field corresponds to um, homomorphisms of free abelian groups uh, satisfying this condition and, and this condition. So in the box here, that's called a contracting chain homotopy. So it's not difficult to, to, to check that, uh, you know, you, you, from a discrete vector field, you, you can algebraically write down a chain homotopy. That's done in the computer. Um, so homotopies are handy for the following reason. Um, if you have a finite group G, like the Mathieu group, um, you're going to get, uh, you, if you take for a prime P, the, the Celo P subgroup of your group G, and GAP can do that using the kind of techniques from, uh, that Alexander mentioned yesterday, um, there's, a, there's an inclusion of groups, or the Celo group into the big group, um, and that induces a, a, a homology homomorphism. Yep, that's just homology is a functor. So how do you um, produce homology homomorphisms on the computer? I'm going to spare you the pictures, but it's very similar to the fundamental group. You use these arrows to push things around <laughs> and so on. And you, you induce, you don't just calculate the homology groups, but you can also calculate the homomorphisms. Yeah, I won't give the details, but, but the, the message is that if you have a discrete vector field, you can do this algorithmically. So then you can invoke a, an old theorem, Cartan and Eilenberg, which says that um, for prime p, this, 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 uh, the Celo subgroup is a small group, hopefully, and, and of your big group. Uh, and there's a, for, there's a surjection from the homology of this uh, Celo subgroup onto the p part of the homology of your The, uh, uh, what do I mean? I mean, um, if I take Z12, I guess I mean Z4, you know, the, the, yeah, the Z, yeah, yeah, the, the, 
I'm thinking of the groups as a direct sum of uh, groups of prime power order, and it's, it's the, yeah. So, uh, so using the discrete vector fields, you can actually implement that. And the theorem says that this homomorphism is surjective. So if what you're really interested in is the homology of G, well, if you can do it for every prime P, you, you can do it for G. Um, so, and you know that you have a surjection from this homology of this smaller group onto the big group. And the theorem by Carton and Eilenberg, I won't go through the details, but it tells you what the kernel is. And the kernel involves doing calculations with permutation groups, double cosets, and so on. I, I won't go through the details, but you do need to use gap to do this. Um, and you can induce that. And so that's what's going on in the, in the, 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 the gap function group homology. Yeah, you, you, you construct resolutions or contractible spaces for smallish groups and then piece things together using theorems uh, from the homology. So here is a, an example of a bigger group that I was asked to calculate by somebody a couple of years ago. Um, it's just an example of a gap calculation, but it's, even, it's an even bigger group. And this one did take a few minutes, uh, but, but you can get some quite big groups. Somebody wanted to know this uh, using this, this technique. So it's discrete vector fields, explicit resolutions for small groups, and con explicit contracting homotopies. Um, okay. So now uh, there's time for a bit of maths, a bit of old maths. Um, so far, I've kind of cheated in the small group examples in that I've constructed a space, e.g., only for very small groups using polymake or whatever. What happens if you have a big group? So we can use uh, Alexander's idea of divide and conquer. If you have a big group, maybe you can get it to act on something with small stabilizers. Um, so here's a perturbation lemma that's implemented. So imagine then that you have a chain complex of free abelian groups. Each free abelian group has a free G action of the group G. Uh, I suppose the chain complex is exact, so, so that's what I'm saying there. Um, Oh, no, uh, uh, but well, let's suppose that the groups are not assumed to be free. That's the point. So in all my examples so far on GAP, I chose groups where the stabilizers are trivial. I could have chosen groups where the stabilizers are non-trivial. Then what you do, well, you can use an old lemma of CTC wall, which says this. Suppose that for each, now P isn't a prime, P is just an index, that for each degree P, Suppose that we have a, a free ZG resolution of the ZG module CP. So these Cs are actually not just free abelian groups, they're, 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 they're ZG modules. And suppose that somehow you can construct for each degree a free ZG resolution of this module, ZG module CP. Then what Wall says is that you can piece this information together to construct uh, a free ZG resolution of the group. And in degree N, um, the, 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 the module, the ZG module Rn, is a direct sum of these modules dPq, where P plus Q is equal to N. Uh, let me give a f some more details. Um, or maybe even a, a proof of how you do it, because the proof is what you have to implement. It's not the statement. You have to implement the proof. So you, you have your sequence of non-free modules, but for each module you have a, a column of, of, of an exact, an, you know, a resolution for C1 and a resolution for C2 and so on. And at the bottom you have this... Uh, homomorphism, I'm going to now call it D0 in, in each one, and, and, and this really is a, a chain complex, so D0 applied to D0 gives us 0. So what you could do then is you could, um, you could, take, a, you could take a generator here, map it down, map it down here, um, and then you could lift it up to here, and then you could extend. Uh, so you, you, you take 
uh, generator here, map it down, map it down there. And because this is onto, you can lift it here and you get a, a, a homomorphism across here. And then if you've got this homomorphism, you can take a generator here, map it down, map it across, lift it up, and so on. So you can, you can produce lots of lifts, and you get a diagram like this. Um, and you can set delta equal to d0 plus d1. And, and then you could say, well, what about delta squared? Is it 0? Yep. Yeah, of, of yeah, so typically c0 would be z. No, 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 no. Um, OK, no, the, sorry. So yeah, it's, it's fair enough. So typically, if you have a group G, typically C0 would be ZG or something. Uh, and you want a free of the, yeah, oh my God, it, yeah, you want, you, I, want a a I want a free ZG. The, the point of the lemma is to get a free ZG resolution of Z. So this would be a chain complex of ZG modules whose zero homology is Z, but they're not free. So I want to make them free. They're free resolutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of ZG modules. Well, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, yeah. Well, you're right. No, not of ZG. Yeah, yeah. You know, I see your point. Um, this is. I could, I can construct a free ZG resolution of ZG, no problem. It's just ZG. But I want a free ZG resolution of Z. Which is is what I'm trying to do, so I think that's the that's the. Um, so I I can produce delta the the sum and then I can ask about delta squared. Uh, I don't know why I've put d one, but anyway, um, <laughs> if I square delta, I don't get zero. I don't. It looks like a typo there. Uh, why don't I get zero? Well, because up here my construction, there's no reason why d one d1 is going to be 0. So there's a problem. I, do, I don't get a, a chain complex when I add these differentials up. So then I go, uh, I do something more. I say, well, hands above. Um, if I do d1, d1, it turns out that I can lift it up. So, so if I have, I can lift it up to something here. And so I produce a, I can produce a homomorphism up this way. The details aren't important. But you can, you can th the point is, that I keep saying, I can, given an element here, I can lift it. And how would you lift something? How can you choose? In a book on homological algebra, they say choose an element in the, uh, but how would you choose? And the point is you choose using a contracting chain homotopy. If you have a contracting chain homotopy, the, the functions h go up, you just apply h to them. So as long as you keep the contracting chain homotopy everywhere, you can do this choice, uh, and so on. So you have to keep on going. And eventually, uh, you find this, this restated uh, lemma of CTC wall that you can construct this resolution, uh, where for any given sum and you, you've only got finitely many non-zero terms. So you can do calculations with it. And moreover, if you think about it, if you start off with a chain complex which is contractible, and if you've encoded the contraction as a contracting homotopy, and if you produce columns which are contractible, and if you encode that, those contractibilities as a contracting homotopy, you can piece it all together to give you a contracting homotopy on the, on the result. So, so that's the, the trick there. I think I've said that. I've said that. So let's, let's do, do this in an example. Um, so this maybe is your question <laughs> with the example, okay? Suppose that we can compute a free um, so what have I got? I've got I've got a chain complex on which the group G doesn't act, doesn't act freely. But for each cell I, of the chain complex I can talk of the stabilizer group. And suppose that somehow, and the stabilizer groups hopefully will be small. And so maybe we can use some naive method to produce explicit resolutions for the small stabilizer groups. Suppose we can compute a free ZGE. <laughs> that looks like a lam K lambda resolution for each stabilizer group. Then we have um, 
you, you know, you, you extend scalars to, to, to if you have a, if you, so, so G E lambda K, that's a subgroup, but you can extend scalars to get a free ZG module. Uh, and it all pieces together. Um, yeah, the lambda, I've, for some reason, I've gone to my indexing from I. It's I and J, I use lambda. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why I've switched. Well, I do, it was an alter to slide, so, yeah. Um, but anyway, the, the, the point is the details aren't that important. The point is if you can keep track of contracting homotopies, you can piece them together to make new contracting homotopies on bigger objects. Um, and so you can use, and then I think I, this is probably a place to, to stop the, the talk, you can use this trick, uh, and I've done that in GAP to, to, you know, if you have a nilpotent group, not necessarily finite, and you want a free resolution, well, you, you, can, you can use the trick, and it's implemented. For crystallographic groups, which are not Bieberbach groups, which have stabilizer groups, you can use the trick to, to produce resolutions and calculate homology. For coxeter groups that act on nice polytopes, you can use this trick, and that's implemented. For graphs of groups, so Renaud mentioned graphs of groups, you can use the trick. Uh, and then um, what's relevant maybe to, to, to this workshop is the last line. Um, in principle, you can use the, the trick for, for calculations related to modular forms. And I have things implemented in, in GAP, which I'll talk about later, but I'm not claiming that they're particularly efficient, but it, it's doable. That's there. And I think I, I'm not, I'm not going <laughs> to talk about three manifolds. So, what I will do is I'll just put some problems up, and then if people are <laughs> interested, you can play with them. And if not, you, or you can ask me later, or uh, I think I should stop at that point of the lectures. And I can't remember where the problems were. Oh, down here. So there are some problems related to what I've been talking about in the second talk. Um, you could have a go at, for example, um, you could take the space group, the four-dimensional space group, number two in the library, and this is not a, a Bieberbach group. Th th this does have stabilizers. So you can try using the command resolution cubicle crisp group, which is a good chunk of... Um, Bui Antoine's PhD thesis. It looks <laughs> it's one command, but I mean there are things to do, uh, and you can piece Wall's lemma together and so on and produce uh, a resolution. So for crystallographic groups, you have to decide how to contract Euclidean space. That's one of the problems. Um, you have to produce a contracting homotopy on 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 Euclidean space. Well, once you do that. Um, you can piece things together, and then you can try calculating the homology. Um, and I'll talk about cup products in a, in a subsequent talk. In the next talk, uh, you can calculate uh, things like the, the cohomology ring generators and so on. But maybe a more fun problem, if, you, if you're interested, is this one, which is taken from a paper in Journal of Algebra. Um, you could try this. So suppose you take a, a, a finite group G and a prime P, and let APG denote the set of non-trivial elementary abelian P subgroups. And then delta APG is the simplicial complex, uh, the order complex of that, so it's, it's known as the Cullen complex, whose n simplices are chains of, dis of inclusions of distinct subgroups in APG. You get a simplicial complex. Is it a typo? Why? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a, t it's a typo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A typo, yeah. Um, and so, f for instance, you could take the symmetric group, G equal to S7, and you could try to construct this simplicial complex of Cullen, and you can ask, what's its homotopy type? <laughs> and in general, that's a very difficult problem, but if you choose problems carefully, you might get an answer. So you could try this. Um, it, you can see in GAP that it's actually uh, a wedge of spheres, and you can use GAP to calculate what wedge of spheres it is. How does it work? It, 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 you, you'll be, be creating the Cullen complex, which is an enormous simplicial complex, and then you'll use the naive discrete vector field algorithm to be a small complex with few cells, and you should be able to read off the wedge of spheres. 
So there's some problems uh, if people are interested, but I won't. That's all I have. <laughs>